My name is Andrew Eriks. I used to live in a city you've probably heard of called New York. My mother is Terry Eriks, Teresa Raley. She's in the phone book under E, if they even have those things anymore. Maybe you can just Google her, I don't know. If you know the city and you read this, find her, please. Don't show her this, but do me a favour and tell her I love her, and let her know that I'm really trying to come home. Really. It all started around the time I turned 25. I decided for no good reason that it was time for me to give up taking a backpack to work. Idiotically, I thought that it would make me look more like the guys I saw on the trains. You know, the ones the women are with, the guys who made it. I figured that if I weren't lugging around a ridiculous looking book bag everywhere like some brain dead kid, I'd be seen as more mature because I wouldn't look, you know, stupid. Yeah, right, I know. But that meant that I had to give up reading on the subway going to and from work. See, I'd get a seat because I got on early, then hide a book under the pack in such a way that it's peeking out just enough for me to see it, because you know, who wants to get jumped for reading, and like hell was I going to wear a messenger bag, please you're joking right? For a while I had an mp3 player I got from my mum, that helped pass the time for a while and I could even put books on it from the library, it was perfect, because no one can tell what you're listening to, if you nod your head every once in a while they think it's music. But I dropped the thing getting off the train in one of those shoving me, let me off of the damn train fits. Ever since then it's been shutting down at the end of every song if I don't tap it to skip to the next track, so I gave that up too. Instead, every morning on my way in, I'd sit on the endless A train, with nothing to do but watch the other passengers. I was relatively shy, I'm serious, I talk like I'm not, but I really am. See, I didn't want to be caught looking, or even looking like I was looking. Instead, I watch people from the corner of my eye. I figured out pretty fast that I wasn't the only person in the world who wasn't totally comfortable out in public. Different people hid it in different ways, but I could see through them. I made groups for them in my head. First, there were the fidgeters, who couldn't get comfortable, always moving their hands, shifting their weight and edging their legs closer to their seat, then away. They were the most nervous types. After them, second, we have the fake sleepers, who would take a seat and practically close their eyes in the same moment. Lots of them were rich white guys who did this to avoid giving a seat to a pregnant woman or an older person. When I saw them, I gave my seat up right away because most of these guys weren't really sleeping at all, and I'd try really hard to get close and accidentally kick their shoe or something. Then I'd be like, oh I'm so sorry I didn't mean to wake you, right? Anyway, the real sleepers, my third group, shifted more suddenly whenever we stopped, or they were startled by loud noises. The fakes just zoned out the second they sat down until the moment they reached their stop, at which point they'd hop up, peppy and alert, and jump off. I didn't like them very much. Why do you ask? Then comes the fourth group, MP3 player addicts. The one people would probably lump me into if they had watched me in my early days. The people in this group were related to the fifth group, the occasional laptop losers. And those in the sixth were ordinary people, the ones who travelled in groups and talked too loudly, so, you know, New Yorkers. I crack myself up. Anyway, right around when people watching was getting very same old, same old, I had my first surprise, a middle aged white man with brown hair, completely average looks, and casual Friday clothing. Dockers, business friendly sweater, you know the type. He was so normal, he was almost too normal, know what I mean? He had nothing special about him, no funky hand movements, didn't weird laugh or anything. It was as if he'd been designed by one of those cop shows to fake you out, like he was born to melt into a crowd. That's why I noticed him. Here I was, purposely trying to see how people acted on the train so I could categorise them, and he didn't act at all, didn't react either. It was like seeing someone sitting in front of the television, watching a documentary about I don't know, something really boring, like fish. The guy watching isn't excited or focused, but he's not looking away either. Present, but not accounted for. Anyway, I'm not that good at being punctual, my mum says, said, so I didn't get on the train at exactly the same time every day. And since I didn't care one way or the other, I didn't try to sit in the same car either. Random was fine with me, so I was more than a month into my people watching and grouping experiment before he caught my eye, that normal guy I told you about. I saw him for the first time on a Monday, I think. Yeah, it was definitely a Monday because I know I saw him the second time on a Thursday, when I was heading home to hang with the same crew I've hung with every Thursday night since we were all in school together. 
Mr. Normal Guy, well, he obviously did catch the same train, and he sat in the same car, the first car, and in the same seat even. Talk about obsessive compulsive, at least that's what I thought at the time. What I should have been thinking however was, crap, that is not normal. Since he caught my attention so well the first time I saw him, I watched him even more closely the next time. Frankly, something about him made me feel really uncomfortable. Mind you, he didn't do anything to make me feel like that. He didn't do anything at all, really. What creeped me out, maybe, was how much he was trying not to be there. The way he sat there in silence, staring straight ahead with a blank expression on his face, no matter what happened, was unnerving. Once, a woman with a crying child entered the car and sat right next to him. Still nothing, he didn't so much as turn his head or stare the kid down, and that little punk was seriously loud too. By the time the subway reached my stop that Thursday, I felt sick, queasy sick, and when I left the car my hands were shaking like I was in the throes of nicotine withdrawal. That man was wrong, he was some kind of freak, a sociopath perhaps. One of those quiet guys who as it later turns out, has a dozen women's heads in his freezer, the first victim likely his own mother. I'm telling you all this so it'll make sense when the next part is so weird, because he freaked me out, so you'd think I would do everything I could to stay away, right? Yeah, I would have thought that too. In my early days, he was just part of my grouping experiment, not a particularly interesting one at that. At least I had convinced myself of that, but it wasn't long before I noticed I'd been wasting time after work in the afternoons, poking around the newsstands reading magazines I didn't want, until the clerk chased me away for a loitering. Unconsciously, I was doing my best to stay off that guy's train, and if I found myself on the platform at the wrong time, his time, I made damn sure to choose the last car, the one as far away from his as possible. The opposite of obsession, right? Fine. Then on my way to work one morning, I saw another person who set off the same warning bells in my head. This time it was a woman in the last car, just as plain looking and just as out of place in all the hustle and bustle around her. The moment I saw that she was in his category, I only realised it later when I had lots of time to think about it. You understand? Well, that moment was when my obsession officially began. All of my people watching which had begun as a way to keep myself from dying of boredom became a religion to me. I couldn't set foot on a subway platform or ride the bus without examining everyone and filling out a mental checklist in my head. Plain clothes, solid colours, no brands, check. Expressionless, no casual glances out the window or toward other passengers, check. No bags, purses or accessories, check, check, check. We've got another. I started calling them the strangers. Like any other covert, I loved that connection. Finding my next stranger fix was my ritual. I didn't see them every day, even after I started taking the subway more than I needed to, but they were there often enough. Seeing one would set me on edge, make my palms sweaty and my throat dry. I know that sounds like a bad thing, but like I said, I was obsessed. Even though they didn't pay me any attention, they never looked at me or made eye contact, treating me as if I was totally invisible. I still felt like I was totally exposed in their presence. A flashing neon sign in the mist of Times Square, as it were. I could see them, playing as day. How could they be so oblivious of me? But they never noticed me, not in any way that I could tell. And when my curiosity finally gave my fear a beatdown, I decided to follow one of them. I thought I should go back to my first, the man on the afternoon train who always chose the same seat in the same car. I imagined he'd be easy to find, so I went to a likely platform and waited, watching for him in the windows of the front cars that pulled in, and eventually, there he was. I got on and took a seat diagonally across from him, doing my best to look inconspicuous. We rose until the end of the line, and he got up and walked out before I did. Keeping a reasonable distance between us, I tailed him, but it wasn't much of a trick. He didn't even leave the platform. He took a seat on one of the cleaner wooden benches, as expressionless as always, and I went behind one of the big map boards and waited, trying to look blasé. After a few minutes, the next downtown train arrived, and I watched him get in and take the same seat. I didn't have the courage to follow him again. He hadn't gone anywhere, he just rode to the end of the line, and then what? Rode it back? What possible reason would he, would anyone have for doing that? It nagged at me. Long after I'd taken the next downtown back home, I tried to get some rest but I couldn't leave her alone, not until I could make some sense of him. I was beyond confused, I was angry. 
Why was this jackass, this inhumanely silent and still bastard, riding trains back and forth and going nowhere? He bothered me, but not the way a guy who unapologetically slams into you on the street without looking twice does. He bugged me the way spiders do. Big hairy train riding freak spider guy makes me want to get the hell away from him. That was how the strangers were beginning to look to me. They made my eyes water and my mouth dry. But did that stop me? Hell no, of course not. Desperate to satisfy my curiosity, I followed him again the next day, and again the day after that. Every day for at least a week, the two of us made our silent trips together, though only I noticed. By the end of the week, I was following him for hours, all day, every day, all night. Well past the time the train started running night expresses and passing stations like my stop in parts of town that shut down for the night. We rode from the east end of the city system down around and up to the top, then back again. I wasn't people watching any longer, I was person watching, stranger watching. I didn't see anyone else on those trains I rode that week. We could have been the only two people on the planet for all I knew or cared. I lost my job after that. My manager was nice about it but didn't leave any room to beg. I'd lost my concentration, my focus, I'd become totally unproductive, it was actually kind of a heartfelt speech, to be honest, he had been a nice guy, but you know what, as distracted as I was, I can barely remember him, or the words that came out of his mouth during the talk, all I could think about while he was speaking was my new work, my responsibility, my vigil, what would that man, that thing on the subway get up to when I wasn't there to keep my eye on him, how would we all survive without me watching? I left work for the last time at noon that day. Normally I'd have started tailing my subject at 5.30, but I knew, I just knew that he'd be waiting for me. I wish now that I paid more attention to that day. Was it sunny? It was summer after all. When did it start feeling like he knew when I'd be there? I wonder because that was the last day I could have walked around downtown, my last chance to have had a beer or two at that joint with the cream coloured menus and the tables on the sidewalk. I could have sat there, checking out the girls walking by in their summer dresses, or would that place make me drink wine, whatever, it doesn't matter. The point is, I could have had a good time, gone home and put all this insanity out of my head. I could have looked for a new job and started reading again. Instead, I waited for his train. Thank you for watching today's video and if you liked what you hear please consider subscribing, leaving a like and a comment.